give me attention just a few minutes this morning. I'll bring the message the Lord's laid on my heart. Acts chapter 2. This is the well-known scripture of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. He was already here, but he came in power. And this morning, you hear a lot of talk about Acts chapter 2. Whole denominations and churches are built around Acts chapter 2. But one of the reasons there was so much great things happen in Acts chapter 2 is what I'm going to talk about this morning. Look at verse number 45. You'll never hear the TV preachers preach this verse. They sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man had need. They missed that in somehow or another. And they, continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, from house to house, uh, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. What does that mean? Singleness of heart. Next verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But look back at verse 44. And all, see that little word, all of them that believed were together and had all things common. All them believers in that early church were together. They wasn't fussing and fighting. And one group over here saying this, another group over here saying that. You know what brought power in that church? They were in one mind and one accord. One mind, one accord. Listen, the devil can't stop a church where people think and work and labor together. Can't stop it. You know what the devil does? Get in between you and divide you and divide us. Now, my message this morning is all together. It said they were all together. If we had everybody in our church, all of us, together, doing things. Listen, they, Lord have mercy. You talk about a force for God. There's no telling. Listen, there's enough Christian people in the United States to get anything done or stop anything from happening if they could all get together. But the, it seems like the, uh, the, the longer we go, the more devil splits everybody up and this and disagreeing about that, fussing about that. And a lot of times it's stuff not even fussing about. There are some things worth fighting over, and, and we'll talk about some of that. There are some things that are non-negotiable, but there's other things the devil divides peace people over, and, and uh, Lord in mercy, just stops us from getting done. So I'm going to talk about all together. The, the dream of every pastor is a church where everybody in it is right with God. Uh, the old preacher said one time, they said, uh, preacher, uh, how's your church? He said, my church, everybody, 100% willing. And he said, uh, how's that? He said, 5% willing to do the work and the other 95 willing to let them. That's what I'm sad to say, but that's the way it is in, in most churches this morning. There, if, if everybody in the church was right with God, I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to that person beside you or the one behind you, don't, don't come up and say, boy, I wish old so-and-so would have been there. I'm talking to you. If everybody in our church was right with God, that there would, there, would, there, would, there would never be a need for a Sunday school teacher. There would never be a bus that didn't have a driver. There would never be a financial need that wasn't met. There would never be a disagreement that couldn't be solved. There would never be a, a nursery that needed workers. There would never, if everybody in the church was really right with God. Now, I'm going to tell you what's wrong. 5% uh, 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 is willing to do it and 95% is willing to let them. And that's the sad truth of most churches. And, and we're, we're way ahead in a lot of areas. So this morning, let's talk about it. The first thing I want to say is everybody, everybody ought to be converted. Everybody ought to be saved. Now, there are churches, and, and I'm not naive enough to think that everybody in the church is saved and every church. They're not. But everybody should be saved. Everybody in this room today should be saved and know you're saved. Amen. 
If you don't know you're saved, talk to me after church. Come up here at the altar and get it settled. Settle it on God's word. You ought to know where you're going when you die because you might die today. Uh, you never know. You just don't never know. You never know when your last breath's going to breathe, breathe. You never know when your last trip to church is going to be. You ought to know that you are saved. Did you hear me? You ought to know that you're saved. You ask your question this morning. If I died right now, do I know that I'd go to heaven? You know how I know I would? Here's how you can know. I'm depending on what Jesus Christ did for me on that cross to take me to heaven. According to that, I have guaranteed absolute sure assurance that I'm going to heaven when I die. By faith, I believe that Jesus Christ paid the price and when I trust him to take me to heaven, that's the only thing I'm trusting to take me to heaven. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a preacher. I'm not going to heaven because I wear a tie. I'm not going to heaven because I go to church regular. I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid the price for my sin. You ought to know that. Everybody in here ought to know that. Don't go through life saying, well, I don't even really know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell or what's going to happen. Don't go through that. Everybody ought to know that. You kids ought to know that. You young people ought to know that. Nail it down. Settle it this morning. We ought to have 100% converted membership. Everybody ought to be saved. You ought to be a part of a Bible-believing church. If you're not a member of this church, join today, brother. Get in on it. So I want to be a part of a Bible-believing church God ordained the local church for his work on this planet. I know these people don't like that, but it's truth. And I ain't talking about these walls. I'm talking about people, a body of believers that meet together at a certain time for a certain purpose, and that is to preach and pray and worship God. That's what a church is. So this morning, everybody ought to be a part of it. Second, number two this morning, I, I think everybody... Everybody was all there. The Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered in one accord. They was all there. There wasn't one member at home. There wasn't one member gone to the lake. There wasn't one member. They were all together. Now, I will say this just as nice as I know how to say it, uh, but as straight and stern as I know how to say it. Are y'all listening to me? I'm going to say this just as nice as I can, but as stern as I can. Some of you people need to really, really clamp down and work on your church attendance. It's a, pit, it's a disgrace to your family and your, your husband and your wife. And all, the way some of y'all just hip, hop, skip, and miss, hit, miss. It's, it's, it's awful. And I love you. I wouldn't tell you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you that. But listen, you. It, it's going to come back to you one day. It's going to come back. It'll come back to your kids. It'll come back. I'm telling you. Listen, we're in a race with the devil, people. The devil's after our kids seven days a week. For heaven's sake, get them in church. Get them in. The service you miss might be the one God touches your family, touches your marriage, touches your heart, touches your body. Everybody touches your kids, touches your grandkids. We need everybody in attendance. The Bible said in Hebrews 10, 25, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. I know I hear it all the time. I'm a preacher. I hear it all the time. I know what some of you are thinking right now. You see... It, you, here's what you're thinking. You see, God, it's like this. We can attend church more faithfully if your day come at some other time. You've chosen a day that comes at the end of a hard work week, and we're tired. Not only that, but it's the day following Saturday night. And Saturday night is the time that we feel we should go out and enjoy ourselves. Often it's after midnight when we come home, and it's almost impossible to get up and come to church on Sunday morning. And you must realize, Lord, you've picked the very day when the morning paper takes so long, the day when the biggest meal of the week is prepared. We'd like to go to church, but you've just picked the wrong day, Lord. Now let me say something to you this morning. It, it, you shouldn't say, you should, we don't have to go to church church every time? No, you don't. But I'm telling you what, it is an honor. It is a privilege. It is an honor to come to church. It is an God's been good to you people. You're rich. You hear me? You're rich compared to the world standards. That missionary stood right here on this platform a few weeks ago and told to those little kids, you listen to me. You give me your attention this morning. I'm talking to you, every one of you. That missionary stood right here and told us of those little kids in Africa. 
They call them rock quarry kids. And they sit on piles of rocks all day, every day with a hammer, busting rocks, and that's how they get to eat. If they don't do that, they don't eat. If they get sick, they lay there and die. They do without. I'm telling you, listen, you people sitting in here this morning, you are in the 6% of the richest people in the world. Everybody in here. You are rich by world standards. God's been good to you. God's blessed you. And you got some notes. You got good health. And you got up. How, how could? How could we? How could we? Uh, you say, well, that's, uh, listen, I wouldn't miss church on Sunday evening to sit and watch a bunch of spoiled cry baby football players get out there and make me, they can't even stand and honor our country. Are you kidding? I'm going to be at the house of God, brother. I'm going to be in here. I know where my health comes from. I know where my food comes from. I know where my benefits they come from the Lord say amen right there I'm telling you we ought to have 100% and you say well brother Danny you're hard on us I'm being nice to you compared to what you're doing to God Almighty Hey, hey, get your kids in church. Get them in a choir. Get them in Sunday school. That, that would be a blessing if everybody here got that. Amen. And I ain't politicking. But I think anybody's getting paid $2 million a year, minimum, 40 and 50 maximum, they ain't got enough at maturity to stand for the American flag, ought to be ashamed of themselves. You say, well, they're protesting. They're, well, stand outside of the sign and protest it like an adult. Don't be a little whiny brat. Listen, they said, well, they disagree with some things the president said. I disagreed with everything Barack Obama said, but I still honor my flag and my country, and I'd honor him if he walked in here. You know why? We're mature. We're grown-ups. You think our rights wasn't walked over when they passed that transgender mess? Help me, help me. You think we wasn't, uh, you think we ain't been vilified? You think our rights ain't been stomped on when they kicked our Bible out of the school? Yes, it was. But this is my country. That's my flag. And I stand right beside an atheist and salute that flag and honor our country. You know what? That's maturity. Cry, babies, cry. We, you 400 pounds. And, and, and we. Wah, wah, wah. All right, better get off of that. Listen, that which is highly esteemed in the sight of God is abomination to men and vice versa. Amen. Football didn't save you. Football ain't going to judge you. Football ain't your God. I hope and pray it's not. Say amen right there. Lord, I had a preacher friend tell me the other day, he said, I'm done with them. Bunch of whiny brats like that. I'll just watch college on Saturday. I, I've heard it over and over and over and over and over. Of course, I don't like it no way, so it don't matter, make, make no difference to me one way or the other. Listen, if Michael Jordan was playing Larry Bird one-on-one -on -one in a special in Marion in person and it's free, I'd come down here on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. If you don't believe it, hire them to do it and watch me. I'm stepping on our new seats. I'm going to get to that in a minute. My shoes are clean up. The only shouting aloud and stepping on the seats is just when you're shouting in the Spirit. Amen. Church attendance. It's a studies have shown when both parents attend church regularly, 72% of the kids will do it. Now, if you, you attend regularly, you got a 26-7% chance, 28% chance that your kids ain't going to go. That's if you go regular. Both of you! When only the dad comes to church and the mama don't, there's a 55% chance your kids will keep coming. When only mom comes to church without dad, there's 15%. Where's the men? Where is the men of this country? When a man stays at home and sends a wife and kids to the church, there's 15% change. Your kids. What's, it, what's this world going to be like when, when these kids get up 25 years old, y'all? Lord have mercy. We may not even be able to do this. 
We may have this taken away from us by the time he... You better listen to me. Enjoy it and bless it while you can. God's got your health in his hands. Don't come crying to God saying, Lord, help me, help me, help me, when you've disregarded and spit on everything he told you to do. Number three, we need all to cooperate. We need all to cooperate. Man, wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody in the church went and thought, wouldn't it be a blessing if somebody says, well, I don't do that. Well, I don't. Well, I do. Well, I do. Listen, I, 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 that's one thing they're having a problem with football. They all disagree. A team, to win a game, they all have to agree. They have to think together. They have to work together. If we're fighting an enemy, we need to fight together. If we're working on the church, we need to work together. We need to cooperate. There's always some of There's always these little mountain churches. We don't have it much here. Thank God. We all get along pretty good. And I mean, we don't fuss over what side the piano's on. I've heard of churches fussing over what side the building the piano is going. Really, really. Now, the world's going to hell. And then they're arguing. Saying, well, I, we've always had it on the other side. I just don't think that it pleased the Lord uh, to put it on this. I mean, stuff like that, silly, ridiculous stuff, and not cooperating. Ah, Lord, have mercy. Uh, we, need to, we need to cooperate. We need to work. We need to pray. Said this old man one time, he, he slept through every single service. And it wasn't but uh, the only two words he ever heard in church was, number one, you're dismissed, or number two, let's vote. Other than that, he slept through everything. And he was an old timer, an old grouchy old man, been there a hundred years, and he'd sit back there. And the preacher got up one morning, and they was talking about uh, things that was going on, and and th- what they was wanting to do with the church and everything. They was going to do some remodeling, and the preacher got up and he said, uh, he said, uh, folks. I tell you, these old lights in here is looking dim and ugly. I believe we need some new, uh, some chandeliers in here. Uh, uh, get us some, uh, some new lights. He said, what do y'all think about that? Let's vote. And when he said vote, that old guy perked up back there. That's the only word he ever heard, you know, was vote or you're dismissed. He jumped up and come running down the aisle, come down through here like I said, I'm against it. I'm against it, preacher. No. The guy said, the preacher said, okay, brother. We'll be glad to let you tell the people, why you're not in favor of this motion? He said, I'm against it for three reasons. Number one, we can't afford it. Number two, we ain't got nobody can play it. Number three, what I think we need in here is some new lights. <laughs> These old ones, <laughs> and, and churches are full of people like that. Just want to be honest. Have you ever seen these people, no matter what everybody said, they got a different opinion? What do you want to be like that for? Why do you always think that you're smart? You've got a better idea. You know a better way to do it. You know a better. I, I told him the other night, we was in here, my elbows and knees was raw. I mean, I mean, I didn't have no skin on my elbows. I crawled, and every, I prayed for y'all. Every, every one of these seats, I crawled every one of these aisles. We are putting these things together, and, and I was thinking, the first person that comes in here and says, I, I, I'm telling you, I'd lose I'd cuss just about. I'd tell you, but I got over it, and I'm all right now. So uh, go ahead and criticize, and I can handle it. But I'm telling you, brother, why, why does people want to do that? Why do people always want Listen, you can find something wrong. You can find something wrong with me. You can find something wrong with this pulpit. You can find something wrong with everything in here. That ain't why we come to church. We ought to learn how to cooperate. We ought to come how to, how to, how to serve God. How to, I know church. Down in, you've heard me tell this before, down in Georgia, man, it's a true story. Preacher went out one day, and he was at one of these churches where you had to vote on every single little tiny issue, everything. You had to vote on it. And he was down at the flea market, and this guy had these big old boxes of uh, toilet paper, tissue paper. And uh, preacher said, what do you take for that? He said, I'll make you a deal on that, preacher. You come back and pay me next week, get me something from a church. He said, I'll let you have it. Unbelievable price. Almost give it to him. He got that stuff, buddy. He got that stuff and took it in the closet and down there in the basement of the church where they kept stuff like that. He stored it over there in that closet and everything. And he thought, hallelujah, I've really done good. I've saved the church money. Man, I've, I've went out here and I found me a deal on this. Well, Sunday evening, God. Sunday evening, he was walking down the hallway and the head daddy rabbit 
come walking in. The head daddy rabbit is in a lot of these little country churches. They got an old guy that's been a deacon 146 years at least. They gave the land the building to build on. Their family runs a whole church. You know, if you've never been in one of them little churches, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? And boy, the old daddy rabbit come down through there. He said, Pastor. <laughs> like that, ordering him around. Pastor came around and he said, yeah, brother, how you doing? He opened that closet door like that. He said, what is that? And the pastor said, well, that's, man, that's toilet paper, man. Don't you know what that is? He said, I mean, what's it doing in this closet? He said, brother, I found the best deal I ever was. You wouldn't believe how cheap I got that. He said, we did not vote on this. I'm bringing it before the church. He said, they almost had a church split. He called it the issue of the tissue. <laughs> People quitting church, getting mad, resign their position. Listen, that's exactly what the devil wants and he laughs his head off while people over the church house fussing with each other. I've had, um, good night, I guess I've had five this morning. This morning. By the way, they say, all right now, Brother Denny, Get up there and preach and tell people not to get food on our new seat and all that. You know, usually I don't think about that because in my mind, I can't imagine a grown woman being dumb enough to bring food in the church. I can't, I just can't grasp that. Well, I never brought food for my kids. There's Cheerios laying in the floor. I, listen, we, I would, was never allowed to bring food or drinks in God's house. I wouldn't even think to preach on that because I think, are people that crazy? People bring a Mountain Dew in the house of the Lord? This ain't the movie theaters, y'all. This is God's house where we come to worship Him. You say, well, I'm thirsty. I am too. I got something up there and I water and I drink it after it's over. Or I go out and get me something. Anybody, I, you know, I won't, I won't throw a piece of, paper down on the church parking lot if I did smoke and I don't and I never have in my life but if I did smoke I'd have enough respect for God's house to either do it in my car or get off the property somewhere really I mean you wouldn't think preachers would even have to normal people would think why would you even mention I mean isn't that common I mean people dress any way in the world at church I'm telling you people what's happened to our country Lord have mercy, I didn't mean to get off on all that. Amen, yeah, Brother Danny, preach it. I'm telling you what, Lord have mercy, get candy in God's house. Candy in the house. You say, well, that makes him be good. I can tell you how to make him be good. In case you don't know, in case you don't know, if he's, if he's too little to learn that, he needs to be in the nursery, and if he's big enough to learn that, he can say, big enough to learn to be still and be quiet and wait till he get to the church to eat. And I'm not saying that because we got all new stuff. You just think you you would think that people are smart enough to say, "No, we're not taking food in the church." Amen. You don't sit there like a little dog every few minutes. No world wrong with y'all. I guess you just wasn't trained right. You didn't have a mama or taught you or something. I don't know what your problem is. I hope you did. Well, now everybody's feeling good. I guess. 100% cooperating on our pews, on our chairs, on our carpet. Number four, if you didn't like that one, you're going to like this one less. All ought to give. All ought to give. 1 Corinthians 16, every man, everybody in here today, they told me when I got one dollar, one penny, one dime is the Lord's and 90% is mine. The Lord lets us keep 90%. If I gave you $100, if God has given you health and God has let your heart beat, people, people, are you that stingy? Are you that mean? Are you that cold-hearted? Are you that greedy? If God Almighty gives you a brain and you're smart and you can make money and he gives you $100, you're not going to give him 10 you give the government more than that. You respect the government more than God Almighty. I'm telling you, brother, I fear God. I fear Him. He's got my life in His hand. 
You can, you can count on it, buddy. Mine's going in here on Sunday morning by the grace. If somebody gives me $5,000, hint, hint, I'll put my 10% in there. If somebody gives me $10, I'll put my dollar in and an offering on top of that. If everybody did that, the church would never, ever, ever have. Lord, I know those people in church, they're so stingy. They sing through their nose, keep them wearing their false teeth out. I mean, they're tighter than a bark on a tree. I tell the Lord, they'd sit there and they, they have that dollar on Sunday morning and I go to the offering place and they get that dollar and they, and they say, well, I give in other ways. Uh, you, you just stink in line, line. Say, I just say, that's a lie. You know that's not right. You know that's not right. I give in other ways too. Lord have mercy. So this old man and woman sitting out and eating in a restaurant one day. And the old man, he's over just a chowing down like that. And the old woman, she's just sitting there looking out the window. And the waitress comes and said, ma'am, don't you like your food? And she said, yep, Paul ain't through the teeth yet. That's stingy there, buddy. I believe I've been in church for them people before. That's stingy. That's stingy, man. Lord, have mercy, that's stingy. 100% ought to give. Let me ask you something this morning, and I'm through. You doing your part? Preacher, you don't understand. I make a lot of money. And if I get, that's a lot of money, same percentage. That's what tax ought to be, flat rate for everybody. That's what it ought to be. That's what God's, and that way everybody gives the same percentage-wise. If you make, uh, I know people give real good when they made $100. They started making a lot of money, and now it's, ooh. Well, we can pray the Lord can put you back down to 100 if that'll help you. The truth is, he gives you everything you've got. And don't forget, he can take it away. Don't forget that. I'm just reminding you, he can take it away. Just like, just like that. One more thing I'm through this morning. I want to say we all ought to live for God. You're the only Bible some people's ever going to read. No, some people will never hear the word of God except what they see in your life. You're the salt of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, we, I heard about a preacher, a man, a businessman. He's real rich and he, he died, and in his will, he died like on a, on a Sunday or something, and it came out that he, he was going to give $1,000 to every pastor in the county to encourage them. And this one pastor had resigned the day before. And he gave up and gave up his church, and they said, you got $1,000 for you to preach yesterday. And he says, oh, my gosh, oh, man, I messed up. And see, that ain't why you preach, of course. That ain't why you live for the Lord. But you can give up right before God really wants to bless you. You really can. I got to thinking about this this week. I heard the news. Somebody, I think one of my daughters, Corey, texted me, told me about Hugh Hefner dying, going into eternity. And somebody said, what do you think about that, preacher? I thought, you know what? I would not want to be in his shoes right now. I'm not his judge. I hope he got saved. But I'm telling you people, the, they got on TV and the movie stars was crying and we're going to miss you, Heft. And oh, what all he had done for society. That man was the devil's D.L. Moody. He was a devil. I don't care if you like that or not. You, you can choke on it if you want to. That man pushed this generation toward hell for people. I remember when I was a kid, and that, that, that stuff, people started talking about playboy, playboy, playboy. There's no telling how many homes been ripped apart, how many kids gone to sleep at night crying, where's mama, where's daddy, fussing about. And, I, and it wasn't all his fault, but the devil used him to push a generation to hell. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes right now. What this world thinks is great, God looks at. Completely different. That's what God looks at. See, the Lord looks at it like life's this long and there's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. All the important stuff we think happens right here. But forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's what matters. Everybody. All right, there's some people in here this morning. You ought to take this mild rebuke 
that I've given you this morning. You ought to man up. You ought to man up. Some of you ladies ought to woman up, I reckon, or whatever that you say for that. And say, you know what? I'm going to quit letting everybody else carry the load. I'm going to be faithful to church. I'm going to serve God. Not, not for me, not for me the preacher, but for your sake and your family. Rededicate your life to God this morning. They were all there. When the Holy Ghost came, they were all there. It wasn't half of them gone fishing and half of them gone to the mountains and half of them gone. And I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with that stuff unless it's church time. Listen, it's wrong to go say hey to your mama when it's time to go to church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what the Lord said. We need to get our priorities right and the Lord will bless you for it. Let's stand. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed.